hydrodynamics of micro swimmers, where we are interested in, uh, to understand how the flagella in micro swimmers can synthesize. And we are also interested in other topics like photosynthetic systems in algae and plants. And for last few years, we have worked on cell mobility and control uh, and pattern formation in biological systems. So here I show you one example where we work with the social or mobile epithelium discoidium cells, and then you stop these cells and expose them to special heterogeneities. You see these beautiful spiral patterns. So you have, depending on the initial conditions, you can have a situation where the cells completely ignore the obstacles. So you observe these beautiful spiral patterns and the corresponding boronoid domains. But if you change those conditions, you can have also a situation where the obstacles become wave centered and the cell starts to stream towards the obstacles. And they form these beautiful coronoid domains that reflect the periodicity of the underlying lattice. Only very recently, we started, we started to work on pattern formation in chemical systems. And these are very fresh experiments, so we don't have the full closed story. But if I find some time at the end, I will draw some connections between these experiments and the experiments that we did with the cells. So for the chemical experiment, we use the famous Lossop-Saptilsi reaction, where it involves the oxidization of an organic substrate. So this organic substrate usually is malonic acid that is oxidized in the presence of bromate ions. And usually this happens in an acidified solution and you need the right catalyst for this. You need the metal ions. So the interesting thing is that if you do this reaction in a well stirred condition, so if you have a beaker that you continuously stir, you observe a continuous change between these two colors, sorry, a rhythmic change. So you have a, you have your solution in blue after some time. So after around one minute, it changes color to red and then changes back to blue. And this cycle repeats. <coughs> so when you have your solution in blue, basically your metal catalyst is in the oxidized state. So you have mostly Fe3 plus ions. So that will be this state. And then in blue, you have the Fe2 plus ions. So these are heroin ions. And this cycle repeats. However, if you do the experiment in a petri dish, means that if you don't continuously stir the system, you observe this, depending again on the conditions, you observe spiral or target patterns. So this is an experiment that you observe these waveforms. So these are oxidization waveforms. They are in blue that propagate inside the red, which is in the reduced state. There are a few things that I would like you to pay attention. So first of all, if you look at the wave front, you have a sharp wave front, so the leading edge is very sharp, but you have a diffusive trailing edge. Other thing to pay attention is that you have these two wave centers that actually they are competing. So this wave center has a higher frequency, so it starts to expand its territory. And after a while, if you wait long enough, this wave center loses the competition and disappears. Also, please pay attention that as the two wave fronts collide, they annihilate each other. It's not like mechanical waves that, for example, they can amplify each other. And this is a property of an excitable media that I will come back to that. So just a few things that I mentioned, I also uh, show this in terms of this graph here. As I said, if you look at the wave front, so if you take a snapshot of your experiment, select this line and plot a line intensity, you have a sharp edge, a sharp wave front, but you have a diffusive wave back. The other thing, as I mentioned, you can quantify the competition between the wave centers, right? So let us consider the first wave center. If you take a rectangle like this and plot the light intensity, you get these regular oscillations of the period of 100 seconds. And if you look at your second wave center, this oscillates at a slightly larger period, means it has a smaller frequency. And if you make this timograph, so select this line, plot the light intensity over time. So this is time from top to down, and this is the space. 
This is your first wave center. This is the second wave center that is emitting wave. First of all, it's very clear as the wave fronts collide, they annihilate because the medium goes to the refractory phase and cannot support any wave, so they annihilate. But you also nicely see that the annihilation point starts to drift toward the wave center with a smaller frequency. And if you wait long enough, when the annihilation point collides with the wave center itself, then that wave center disappears. So this means that in an ideal experiment, if you have multiple firing center, the center with higher frequency will soon basically take over and the other wave centers will lose the competition. What's the boundary condition? <clears throat> What's the effect of the boundary? So here, if you, is not, so, so this is a petri dish of the size around nine centimeter. And usually at the boundaries, it could be that some chemicals start to accumulate there. That's why I will show you more experiments and you see that it happens very often that the waves start from the boundary. So this is, or if you have a dirt inside the solution, let's say if you have a dust, you see very, uh, very, I mean, very often that they become also a wave center. But I will come back to that in a moment. Okay. So I will not go to the details of the chemical reaction because it's rather a complex reaction, but one can summarize the reaction into like divide that into three processes. So you have the first process where the bromide ions are consumed. And when the concentration of bromide ions drops below a critical value, then the second process starts. And this is the step where ferroin starts to be, you know, change color to ferrin because you have the change from the reduced state to the oxidized state. So this is one change in color that happens. But then in the process, in the last process, you have the step that basically clock is reset and then you have the uh, inverse reaction, right? So you will have the change from the blue to red and the cycle repeats. So something that I would like to mention is that for our experiments, the experiment that I will show you today, we didn't use the BZ reaction, but we used the modified version of that. And this is a complex reaction, so I will not go through the, the details. But I would, but what I would like to emphasize is that this reaction is well studied. So this means that people know the rates, the rate constants. And this is important when I tell you about the reaction diffusion equation in the next slide. So the rates are pretty much known for different chemical reactions that are happening in the system. Okay, so let us just uh, mention three variables that we will need later for the reaction diffusion equation. So one would be the variable U that the, I mean, the uh, kinetics shows that this is a fast variable and corresponds to the uh, concentration of bromous acid. The other one is a variable V, which measures the concentration of Fe3+, right? So this is the metal ions when they are in the oxidized state. And the last one is the fastest variable that measures the concentration of bromide ions. So these three variables will be important for the step that I explain you the reaction diffusion equation. And what we will use is that the W is the fastest variable it's the second process is U and the slowest is V. And these are all based on the measurements, experimental measurements. So another thing that I would like to mention, and this goes back to the question that was asked, I would like to emphasize on multiple effects that become important in this type of experiments. So when you do the Petri dish experiment, you can close the Petri dish or you can do the experiment in an open air interface setting. So the evaporation cooling, we believe is important when you have, a when you have an open interface. So this is a typical experiment that you would have in CHD BZ reaction. That if you look at the wave front, you see these corrugated wave fronts, and also you see these mosaic type patterns that highlights the presence of some convection rules in the system that I will come talk about this later on. And we believe that actually Maragoni flows are important in these experiments because we added 
tracer particles to the solution, and you can see that there are flows, surface flows, and also flows inside the box. So if you quantify these uh, flow velocities, we believe that there are velocities of the order of 50 <coughs> per second in the solution. And this is most probably is driven by the Maragoni flows because you have different chemicals that are produced during the reaction and the concentration gradient can, can induce the surface tension gradient, which leads to the surface flows. I will come back to this also in a moment later. So this means that when we talk about the surface tension, we could in our experiments have contribution from these two terms. So either there is a surface tension variation due to the temperature gradient, or there is a surface tension variation due to the chemical gradient. And remember, experimentally, there are other experiments showing that indeed, the reduced state of the metal ions have a different surface tension than the oxidized state. So this means that in principle, the surface tension in the red area would be different, indeed less, than the surface tension in the oxidized state. So this can drive some surface flow that one needs to take into account. And for most fluids, as you know, the surface tension variation with temperature is negative. And as I said, these surface flows can also drive all flows inside the system. And for all, so, so what I would like to emphasize here is that we believe that evaporation cooling is, could be very important for our system, especially when we do experiment in an open air interface uh, setting. When you talk about the Maragoni convection, there are two numbers that are important. One is the thermal Maragoni number. So you see that it's proportional to the gradient of the surface tension, the temperature scales <coughs> linearly with the thickness of the fluid. In our experiments, the thickness of the fluid is around one millimeter. So this is small. Delta T is the temperature gradient, rho zero is the fluid density, mu is the fluid viscosity, and delta is the thermal conductivity of your solution. And there is another number. So this is the solutal Maragoni number that is proportional to the density, uh, to the concentration gradient scales also linearly with D, but goes as inverse of the diffusion coefficient of the solutal particles. And it's all, of course, proportional to the gradient of the surface tension with concentration. So when you write the Navier-Stokes equations, they, these numbers, they do not show up directly in the Navier-Stokes, but then you would like to impose the stress-free boundary condition at the liquid-air interface, then these two numbers show up as we are using the later. I would like also to mention that we need the natural convection, really when our convection most of is negligible in our system. So if you look at the Rayleigh number, this is proportional to the, okay, gravity, uh, alpha is the uh, volume expansion coefficient, it stays linearly with temperature, but it goes at tick power T. So for small thickness of the fluid, we believe that the effect of the Maragoni flow is much more stronger than the natural convection. So this is the uh, dimension less number that appears in navier stokes in the semester approximation. Okay, so with all this long introduction, just to prepare you with uh, all type of phenomena that could be relevant for our experiments that I show you now, I come to the main experiment. So, what we do in these experiments is that we change our setup. So you have your Petri dish, that is around 10 centimeter in diameter, and you have this periodic array of obstacles that are made from the PDMS. So the material doesn't matter, but it's a, PDMS is a polymer that you use cross makers to basically <coughs> cross make the PDMS, and it could be permeable to different chemicals. And this could be important for our chemical um, reaction diffusion system. Also in this picture, if you look carefully, there are two different diameters of the pillars, but we did different experiments. So here, the pillar diameter in this part is one millimeter, then 1.5, 1, 1.5, so it periodically changes. The spacing between the obstacles is around five millimeter. The pillars are three millimeter in height, 
and the diameter, as I said, is around either one or 1.5. And the experiment that I will show you now here is the situation that you have the liquid, this is your DC solution, then you have air, I mean, you pour your solution on top of this uh, setup and then you close the petri dish. So there is this air interface between the liquid and the petri dish. Lid. And this is the result that you see. So you see these more or less synchronous waves that start from the obstacles. They stay mostly circular. And then as they collide, similar to what we have in a normal experiment, they annihilate each other. The wave period, if you measure, is around one minute. So if you just select a box here in the vicinity of one obstacle and look at the light intensity oscillations, the period is around <coughs> one minute. And if you want also to know how synchronous are the waves that are you know, emitted from different obstacles, we did the Hilbert transform here. So this is our signal at a given position and time. So T has X as an I of X and T. So we did Hilbert transform, and this is the phase, which is between minus pi and pi. And you see that at least at the beginning, the waves start pretty much in synchrony and propagate outward. Now let us change the setup where we remove the petri dish lid. So this is the situation that we believe the evaporation cooling is important. Uh, so in this setup, these pillars are missing. So the way that you prepare the setup, you peel off the PDMS. That's why you could break some of the obstacles. So what you see here is that there are no obstacles here. This is just the residues. So what you see in this case is that, again, you will see initially circular waves, but soon an instability kicks in and these flower wave patterns appear. So you see that the wave front shows some type of instability. And also, if you look carefully, the number of petals you think depends on the uh, radius of these obstacles. If you look carefully, I can stop the video at some point. The larger pillars, mostly they have four petals, while the smaller ones, they have only three. Of course, it's not always the case, but there is some dependency here. So if I stop the video here, these are the obstacles that they are actually facing to you. So the obstacles you should think are perpendicular to the screen and you are recording the data. So Larger obstacles, they have four number of petals, but smaller obstacles, they have three. This is the face map. Again, similar idea. We do the Hilbert transform. Again, you see that not all the obstacles, but there is some degree of synchrony between the obstacles. And after two cycles of oscillations, the wave front breaks and these lower wave patterns form. Just to show you that really the number of petals depends on the obstacle size or the obstacle radius. This is a different experiment where we increase the obstacle radius from one millimeter to three millimeter. And here, I hope you are convinced that if you look at this data, the number of petals has increased. So this is the same experiment where you look at the face and I'm just focusing on three pillars here. And you see that here, mostly you have six, seven pillars. So the number of, sorry, six, seven petals. So the number of petals has increased. And this is the last experiment that I would like to show you that if you process the data slightly differently, then it really becomes clear that you have seven petals here. So if I stop this one here, you have seven petals formed when the radius has increased. Okay. So keep this observation in mind because at the end, any model that you do, this is something that you expect, uh, you know, to be able to explain based on the model. So you can do uh, like, also you can also make a chymograph for this experiment. Let us assume that you stack up the light intensity along this red line. The time is from up to down, and this is the space. 
So you see, so these black bars show the position of the obstacles, and you see the waves that start from the obstacles, they propagate outwards, and then they collide with the neighboring wave. So the wave coming from the neighboring obstacle, they annihilate. Here also you see the effect that the annihilation point could drift toward the obstacle with a smaller frequency. So again, if you have two obstacles that they have slightly different frequencies, the one that fires faster can expand its territory and take over. I also show you one more observation. We don't have a clear explanation here, but uh, I thought it's nice to also show you this experiment. So what we do here is that we basically impose a small tilt in the Petri dish. So this means that if your Petri dish was completely flat in the previous experiment, you slightly tilt this. So this means that the liquid height is slightly smaller here on the left compared to the right. And what you see, if I run this video, you see that the synchronization waves start from the left and then they propagate to the right. So you see that here they start first and then it propagates to the right. And since this is done in an open petri dish setting, the flower wave patterns also appear. Otherwise, they stay simple. Okay, so now I briefly tell you about the reaction diffusion set of equations that we use to describe this chemical system. So we start with a very simplified version. So let us assume that we start with a 1D system. So you have a chemical reaction that happens at constant temperature and pressure inside a narrow tube. So X is the only variable you have. And you start only with one chemical species. So you have the reaction diffusion equation for variable U. So this is the time variation of the chemical U, and then you have the diffusion term. So you have a scale to a coordinate system <coughs> such that diffusion coefficient is one, and this is the production rate of the U as a function of time, the unit time. And as I said, the diffusion coefficient is a scale. Now let us assume that F of U has a smooth form. So it has a form like this with three roots. And one can show that if the derivative of f with respect to u is negative here, negative here, but positive in between, there is one stable, one unique the traveling wave solution. So this means that you will have a traveling wave pond that sweeps along the tube and it connects basically concentration u1 with u3. So this means that if tau is the time point that the wave arrives at point x, at times t much smaller than tau, the concentration is u1, and at the times much larger than tau, the concentration is u3, right? So that's the wave point that propagates uh, inside the chemical system. And it's easy to show that if you integrate, if you look at the edge of below this curve, calculate the blocks, then the propagation direction of this wave point is minus the sign of this uh, current J. So one can easily show that. And it also makes sense to look at the like the equation in the traveling, in the co-moving frame. So you can go to the co-moving frame and rewrite the equation in this form. So this was for one, this was for the case that you had only one chemical species. Now let us add a second variable. So let us assume that you have a second chemical species that will be B. But from the chemistry of the problem, we know that this variable is a slow uh, value component. So this means that if you add your reaction diffusion equation, you will have a situation like this. So you define a small quantity epsilon to emphasize that your u is the fast varying variable. So this means that your variable v when you have a rapid change in U, you can, with a good approximation, assume that V is not changing much. So here now the diffusion coefficient for U is epsilon, and the other one is assumed to be epsilon delta, so the ratio is of the order of one. So you can actually show that if you ignore the diffusion of the V, this will not change much the dynamics because U is the fast variable, fast changing variable in your system. So 
I will go quick through this set. So when you have two variables, one u, the other one v, assuming that the v is a, a slow changing variable. Also, please pay attention that when you are far away from the wavefront, these terms and these terms should be ignored. So you can set f of u and v to zero to get u as a function of v, right? And this will help you to basically, in this set of equations, treat v as a parameter. So this means that, for example, here, when you also go to the co-moving frame, which is a stretch co-moving frame, you can rewrite the equation for u in this form, but the variable v will appear as a constant in your set of equation. And the main reason is that we know when u is changing fast, v is the slow variable, so it's not changing much. And then that's the right boundary condition. And again, one can show that there is a unique traveling wave solution for this system with a speed that depends on the concentration of your slow variable. And this is, and this exists. I mean, there is a unique solution if these conditions are satisfied. If you take the derivative of the F term with respect to U and calculate at these quantities, both of them are negative. So it has to be with this shape. Okay. So now let us go back to our BZ system, right? We need to write F and G and also H for this uh, system. So it turns out that it's good enough to consider three variables or three chemical species in the system. I told you about this before. So you will have a variable U, another variable V, and the third one W. And W is the fastest varying quantity for uh, chemical concentration. And <coughs> Something that I would like to emphasize again is that W, which is the concentration of bromide ions, is changing fastest. So this means that if you want to simplify the set of equations, you can assume <coughs> that, you know, since this is changing very fast, you can put the left-hand side zero and calculate W as a function of U and V. This means that you assume your W is adjusting very quickly to the variables V and U. But this is the set of equations that we basically simulate in 2D. You can add the diffusion terms here, right? So here you have diffusion term for U, and you can add also diffusion term for V and W when you want to simulate in 2D. <coughs> in a well, when you are staring, you are, when you are simulating the situation that you are staring your solution, then you don't need to add those terms. Okay, so as I said, uh, if you want to work with the two variable set of equations, you can use the uh, fact that the W is changing fastest and get W in terms of V and U, right? And then you have these set of equations to look at. Before showing you the results for the simulation of this system, I would like just briefly to show you also the new lines. So let us consider the chemical the set of equations for two variables u and v. So this is the u by the t zero and this is the v by the t zero, right? And depending on the parameters, your basically the, the intersection point can be an unstable fixed point, which for example, in this case, you lead to a stable uh, cyclic oscillations. But if the line crosses the, you know, the, the U by the T here at this point like this, then you can have the situation that your solution is excitable. <clears throat> so this means that if you have a scenario like this, <coughs> the system is in the stable state, and if you want to have a perturb the system, the perturbation should go beyond the critical value. So if you perturb the system beyond this critical value, then it makes a large excursion in the phase diagram and then comes back to the this one. So this is a characteristic of a excited <coughs> And I forgot to mention that these lines here, three lines here, could be used as simplification for the original <coughs> curve here. So you can have, like based on the form that you have for F of U and V and G of U and V, you can also define this piecewise uh, linear functions there. So this is, as I mentioned, if you are in a regime like this, you need a perturbation that is large enough. If you overcome this barrier, then you make this explosion in the phase diagram and come back to the fixed point. And this is the 
forms that we have for L1, L2, and L3, uh, linear functions. Okay. So now let us map this to our BZ system. Just uh, you get an idea of what's happening as we are moving in the uh, phase space. So let us assume that you are here, right? And you have somehow a perturbation that brings you above the threshold, right? And then you have this large extrusion in the phase diagram. In the first part, which is basically the wave fun, you are somewhere here. So you are in the reduced state, the solution is in red, and your variable V is not changing much, but your variable U makes a jump. So this is the case that you have a rapid change in the concentration of bromous acid. This will be this one. Corresponds to these sharp wave fronts that we have. Then we have the excitation phase that we move along this path. So both U and V are changing. So the, the excitation phase, basically you have an increase from V minus to V plus. So this is the case where the switching color happens from red to blue. And then when you are here, you have a high concentration of your variable V, which is Fe3 plus. So if this is the oxidizer state, and then you will have an abrupt drop in the concentration of bromous acid. So you move like this in the path. And then you have the final step, which is a relaxation phase, and this is a slow process. So that's why when you want to calculate analytically the wave period, the time consuming part is this part. So this part and this part are rather fast. This is still fast, but the slowest is this one, where the concentration of V starts to drop from the oxidized to the reduced state. And that's how you can get analytical form in the period of the wave. Okay, so now let, uh, let me show you the simulations that we did. So we put this set of reaction diffusion equation. I didn't explain the details, but all these functions here come from the chemistry of the problem. This means that there are literature that show exactly why we need to select this form of functions for the BC reaction. So it's not just... Uh, but uh, the variables epsilon and epsilon prime are also measured. <coughs> so there is experimental evidence why epsilon prime is much smaller than epsilon, much smaller than one here. So these are also <coughs> top five experiments. Okay, so now if you take this set of equations and do the simulations, first I explain what you will see. So we did a 2D simulation. The symptoms show the periodic position of the obstacles. And what we assumed is that these obstacles are absorbing bromide ions. So this is one assumption that we we'll say, okay, this PDMS is known from the literature that could absorb different chemicals, but from literature is known that bromide ions and bromine gas can penetrate through. That's why for variable W, we assumed an absorbing boundary condition. So this means that here we are setting W to be zero. And if you do that, you will see that actually these obstacles become wave centers. So you start getting these circular waves that you know, start from the obstacles and propagate also. This is a chymograph if you make a fixed value of Y. So let's say you sit here, you make a line that goes through the obstacles. So this will be the obstacles and you see they act as a wave center. And you can adjust the parameters to get the real period. That's not a problem. So we were very happy to see the simulations, but then our disappointment was very large when we did this control experiment. So remember our PDMS setup. So what we did, we did a gold coating. So you can basically, once you make your setup, after that, you can put a thin layer of gold. This is around 100 nanometer. And the effect of this thin gold layer is that then it, the obstacles cannot, um, cannot absorb the chemicals, right? And we still see that they become a wave center. So this means that in our experiments, the fact or the assumption that we had in the simulations that the obstacles are absorbing some chemical is not the driving mechanism. So it's not the right assumption. And 
Now I will tell you other effects that we believe are playing more important role than the absorption of the chemicals or the obstacles, mostly motivated by these control experiment that we know that when you do this whole coating, uh, the chemicals cannot go through the obstacles. So we did more experiments. One experiment that was very helpful was uh, this experiment. So I forgot to tell you that for all of our experiments, we do surface treatment to make the surface hydrophilic. So this means that when we pour the BZ solution, we want to have a good wetting, right? So we don't want to have islands of the solution. That's why if you look at the like the system, we have fluid that is climbing up the obstacles. So this is like, if you consider the scale, if this is one millimeter, the thickness of the fluid is around at least 100 micron there and becomes smaller as you go up, right? We did one ex few experiments where we didn't do the plasma cleaning, it means that we didn't make the surface hydrophilic. When your surface is hydrophobic, basically, your fluid is standing like this. And we saw that in most of the experiments, the obstacles fail to become fake center. So this means that the fact that the fluid is climbing up, the obstacles should play an important role. This is uh, another experiment where I just want to show you that the <coughs> surface is deformed. So you just have a stripe pattern here and you project it on your, so like on the setup. And you see that there are these surface deformations in the vicinity of the obstacles, right? And we started to think that maybe what we are observing has to do, this is nothing confirmed, these are all work in progress, but we started to think that maybe our experiments have some similarities to the tear of mind phenomenon. So you all know that when the fluid here climbs up the the glass surface, we have more evaporation here. So ethanol evaporates more here than here. So this induces a surface tension gradient. So you have higher surface tension here than here. So the fluid starts to climb up. But then at some point, gravity kicks in and you get these tears that you know, start to form um, here, right? And very recently, I found this uh, theoretical work that might be relevant for our experiments, or to explain our experiments, and this is the following paper. So what the authors do here is that they look at the competition between surface tension gradient and the gravity as the fluid starts to climb up a cylindrical obstacle. So this is the geometry and we are in the duplication approximation it means that the thickness of the fluid is really much smaller than any other length scale in the system. So remember when you have a geometry like this, you have a periodic boundary condition, right? So if you use the cylindrical coordinate system, so this is the way that the authors make the, so, so they make the, spatial coordinate dimensionless. So there is a characteristic length scale and there is a characteristic time scale and they define all these uh, characteristic um, length, time and velocity and pressure. And if you look at the thickness of the fluid that is climbing up the cylindrical obstacle, you see that this thickness scales with the <coughs> surface tension gradient. So this surface tension gradient in this work is driven by temperature gradient. So let's say if you have a slightly higher evaporation here than here, there will be surface tension gradient that drives you know, the fluid going back. And at some point, uh, the gravity is in and they, uh, they look at the instability that appears. The reason that I think this study is relevant for our experiments is the following. So if you work in the lubrication approximation where epsilon is a small and you write the Navier-Stokes equation, that's what you get in the dimensionless form. So here R e is the Reynolds number, rho is the density of the fluid, W is the fluid velocity in the z direction, L is the characteristic length scale, and eta is the fluid viscosity. 
Now, in this dimensionless form, Reynolds number, uh, one can calculate is of the order of one, but since epsilon is small, you can reduce the navi slopes to this form. And then now you need to take care about the boundary condition, right? So when you look at the boundary conditions, one needs to apply the, uh, look at the tangential stress and the normal stress at the free fluid air interface, right? And that's the place that when you look at the tangential stress condition at this boundary, that's where the surface tension gradient comes in. So it comes in the boundary conditions. And the authors study this system, and this is the kinematic equation for H. So H is the height of dimensionless height of the fluid. But what is interesting to see is that when they look, when they do their linear stability analysis. So the geometry is the following. You have the cylinder, there is a fluid that is climbing up the, uh, the boundary due to the Baragoni tension gradient, due to the tension gradient. And this climbing fluid, from, uh, climbing fluid front goes unstable and the fingers appear. Now they show that by doing linear stability analysis, that the, if you look at the most unstable mode, the most unstable mode depends linearly on the radius of the obstacle. <coughs> this means that for larger radius of the obstacle, your more unstable mode is larger, so it goes linearly with that. So this means that the lambda is less, right? So this means that more number of fingers appear at the advancing fluid front. And this is something that could be an explanation for our experiments. We are not yet sure, but I think uh, the analogy is very, uh, very convincing. Okay. Uh, so this kind of maybe explains why the number of petals that we see in the experiment stays with the size of the obstacles in our experiments. But this needs to be done. So for us, the step to be done is that to couple basically the Navier-Stokes equation with the reaction diffusion equation. Let's say if we write the reaction diffusion in the cylindrical coordinate, we need somehow to couple the fluid flow to the reaction, like with the reaction diffusion set of equations and see if one can explain in full details the experimental observation. So this is the step that is in that. Okay. Now I will just show you a few more experiments and that's uh, basically speaking my talk. Um, we did a lot of measurements looking at the surface flows. I told you that we believe the Maragoni flows are important. And in our experiments, Maragoni flows are either driven by concentration gradient because there are a lot of chemical species are produced during the reaction or are driven by uh, evaporation cooling, especially that we observe those lower patterns when we remove the petri dish lid. So this is the experiment that we added tracer particles. So these beads are 20 micron in size. And if you characterize, you can do PID to measure or to quantify the velocity vector field of these particles. And also in this experiment, at some point, when you see the wave front comes, it really affects the bead particles a lot. So this is a very fresh experiment that we need to quantify. Again, remember when there is a wave front that comes, wave front is in the oxidized state, the medium is in the reduced state and is known experimentally that there is a surface tension gradient that is lower in the reduced state compared to the oxidized state. And these are all needs to be done because that's the part that we have to feed back to our reaction diffusion, right? So if we have only reaction diffusion, we believe there is also advection that needs to be included in the, in the simulations. Otherwise, uh, it, does, it will not capture the full story. Um, now, for fun, I will just show you one more experiment. Uh, again, uh, we don't have the full story for this. So what we did was 
So, so far I showed you experiments with cylindrical obstacles, right? So you have a shift law boundary, but you can change your setup to have this kind of rectangular boundary. So you have flat interface here, but you have these circular boundaries, right? And in principle, one can repeat the analysis that I mentioned, like using the lubrication approximation. So we know that also here, the fluid starts to climb up the obstacles. But now if you go back to the work that I presented, you need your boundary condition will be different, right? So you still have a periodic boundary condition, but I'm not sure if the, I don't know, cylindrical coordinates is the right coordinate to be used here, but that seems to be uh, done here. If you look at the experiments, uh, we have a lot of uh, experiments with this setup that shows most of the time the waves start from the curve boundary, not from the flats. So you have the flat part with zero curvature and then you have the edges. And I'm not sure if one, I mean, by doing the simulations, one to explain this observation. So this is just the experiment that I showed you for fun. And with this, I would like to conclude. So I showed you that we observe mostly synchronized waves that are centered around the obstacles. <coughs> Lower wave patterns only appear in the open liquid air interface when we don't have the petri dish lead. The number of petals depends on the pillar radius. We still haven't quantified our data if this dependency is linear. So we need to do more experiments with larger obstacle size. And another prediction from that theory paper that I think is very interesting and we need to do is that that theory predicts that if you reduce the pillar radius below a critical value, the wave front shouldn't break. So, or they at least predict that there will be no instability. So there will be no fingering instability. So what we need to do in our experiments, we need to do more experiments where we systematically reduce the obstacle radius below one millimeter. This is technically a little bit challenging, but let's say it's possible to do and see if we always observe this flower wave instability or there is a critical radius through which the instability disappears. So this is still to be done. And as I said, we believe that the Maragoni flows that are driven either by evaporation cooling or the concentration gradient, we believe are important in our system. With this, I would like to thank the people who did the work and also our collaborators and thank you for your attention. Since uh, I told you that I would like, to, I have time five minutes. Sure. Uh, I told you that I would like also to show you the analogy with the biological system that we worked for a long time. I didn't include those data here because the file size already was huge. So I just show you a few videos. Just that you see that in a completely different system, there are similarities and there are differences. <clears throat> Just very briefly, five minutes also tell you about this system because we extensively studied this one for the last few years. So, this is a model system that if you stop, this does become consistent. So, this means they can detect the gradient and they crawl towards areas with larger um, chemical concentrations. So, these are the cells, they are very tiny, they are 10 micron in size. And if you stop them, they form beautiful spiral patterns. If you wait long enough, they form these months, then migrating slow, and then they stand up 
forming fruiting bodies, and then when the conditions are again positive, they can be dispersed and the whole cycle can start again. So we looked at this part of the life cycle. And if you look carefully, the original experimental data is this one, and this is the process data. So you see that basically the cells start to stream towards the center of the spirals and form these domains. Now, this is just one experiment showing that these cells become highly active if you expose them to the gradient of cyclic AMP, which is a chemical that they secrete in the start and this is just a signaling molecule. So you see there is a pipette here, the chemical is diffusing out, they detect the gradient and they move. And we did a similar experiment that we did with the BZ with these cells. So it means that we expose these cells to special heterogeneities, you can have different geometry of the obstacle. And if you compare this experiment with the experiment of the BZ system, there are similarities. So First of all, you see these waves that are centered around the obstacles. Since these cells are chemotactic, they detect the gradient and they start to stream on the obstacles. So these are some similarities. But the fact that the wave front, for example, breaks and the flower wave patterns appear in the BZ solution is not uh, what we see here. And this is just if you process the data. So you see that. Initially, there are a lot of firing centers, but soon the waves that start from the obstacles, they have higher frequency and they take over. So the, these waves have higher yeah, frequency and the other firing <laughs> centers disappear. This I don't show you. And just last thing that I want to show you is that for the cells, the periodicity of the lattice that you use will be reflected in the Voronoi domains that they form. So if you use a rectangular, sorry, hexagonal arrangement of the obstacles, then you get these triangular domains. And here we have a good understanding of the system. So we use the action diffusion equation to describe this. And we have a relatively good understanding of the system dynamics. Just I wanted that you see that some analogies and differences between this system. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any questions from the audience? Huh? I have only Just one wondering question. about the um, number of petals. I mean, have you ever um, thought about having only a single pillar and see whether yes. it comes from they the are still there. The so we think that it has nothing to do with the interaction between the waves coming from the obstacles. So what we did systematically, we started to increase the lattice size. And also we did few experiments where you have single pillar and it still becomes a single. So we think has to do strongly to do with the property of one obstacle. And the fact that the fluid is climbing up because it's hydrophilic. So is it not possible to um, explain the number of um... So what I think is that, let's say you forget about all the other obstacles and you just consider your reaction diffusion, but you have to somehow include the fact that the field is climbing up and couple the instability, the fingering instability that is observed in that paper with our reaction diffusion. But if that's going to work, I don't know. Mohammed, maybe he'll tell you later. Any questions? Just to clarify on the first of the last slide, you have the reaction diffusion coupled with the nodule stone situation. Yes. The V is supposed to be the slow variable, right? Uh, sorry, I maybe we should have. Uh, Right. I should have used another. Or uh, no, it's just you're considering only yeah. the so, yeah. so I don't see that V is the slow variable in this uh, in the last. So, yes. This that V is the velocity, sorry. And this V is the chemical concentration, which is the slow variable. So, what I think, I'm not 100% sure this is the complete set of the equations that needs to be formulated, but this V here. Is the velocity of the fluid and this one is coupled with your chemical system with V and V, and this V is a small value. So, 
in the previous one, in the slow one, you only have epsilon there when you have the epsilon uh, epsilon inverse up there, right? But in the in this equation, you you no longer has uh, epsilon in the in the v variable in the v equation. So, so in, in the previous equation, I had a term here like a diffusion yeah. term, right? It was epsilon delta, right? And then Laplacian of the v. Yes, yes. you are right. That's we have to include, yes. but. The, I, the basic idea is that since u is the fast variable, mm -hmm. most probably including the diffusion or not including that will not change much the whole dynamics because u is basically driving everything. But in the 2D simulations that I showed you, the, I included. So I had a diffusion term here too. But you are right. Thank you. Actually, you considered the surface tension effect and considered the Marigoni effect. Uh, did you consider the variation in viscosity in the reactive flow? Because uh, viscosity also calls to heavy shell flow. Yes. yes. And it also calls the flow. So are you talking about the variation in the viscosity because yes, there yes. are different chemicals, yes, yes. etc. Yeah, that's also a factor, just I didn't discuss because the system already is very complex. And the reason that I tend to think that's not the dominant thing is that flower weight patterns appear when we just remove the leak. Means that we are not changing any chemical composition, right? So this means that what I tend to think is that the fact that evaporation cooling, so when this fluid is climbing up, there is more evaporation there than the bulk, and this will drive maybe the, you know, the Maragoni flows. And that's the dominant thing that has changed when I do the experiment in an open petri dish. But otherwise you are right. So there are a lot of things that can contribute, or a lot of factors that can contribute to the Maragoni flows here. Okay. If not, let's thank Azam.